In this series, we are continuing our examination of the birth stories of Jesus, trying to look at them from the point of view of the real world of the culture of the Middle East. In our first study, we looked at the birth of Jesus as it's recorded in the seventh chapter of Luke, verses 1 to 7, uh, second chapter of Luke, verses 1 to 7, and we discovered two very important things. And one is that the manger is in the living room and that the so-called inn, the cataluma, is really a guest room on a private home. And that means that Jesus was born in a one-room peasant home, very much like simple folk in the peasantry of the Middle East have been born as they have been born in their one-room homes from probably 10,000 BC up until the present day that his incarnation is complete and that the reader of the text is told that they're in the living room. They laid him in a manger, namely in the living room of the family. Why? Because there was no room for them in the guest room and that thereby everything is in order according to a simple per first century peasant world. Now, as we continue now with our study, we want to look at some of the high points of places where I, as I look at it from a Middle Eastern cultural perspective, having lived now almost 45 years in the Middle East, a part of the Middle Eastern Christian community, as a part of the Middle Eastern Christian community, as I go over the text, there are places in which there's kind of an electric shock goes through my system, where I get these enormous surprises, things that I really don't expect to be happening, and they happen. We're not going to try and cover sort of the whole birth stories verse by verse. That would take us a very long time. And I'm not going to try and repeat to you the things you already know. But rather, we're going to try and look between the lines at the point in which we need to rescue truth from familiarity. Things become so familiar, kind of like the Lord's Prayer, and you can kind of pray the Lord's Prayer without even really thinking about it because you know it so well. And when you come to it sort of, oh, ho-hum, we know this one, and off we go. The mind kind of shuts off because it is so familiar. And that's what happens every time Christmas rolls around. We read these stories, and because they are so familiar, our really mind shuts off, and the cutting edge of what they're saying quite often disappears. So we're going to try and pick up some of those surprises in the story when we look at the story from the point of view of the culture of the Middle East. We're going to begin in Matthew and in the first chapter of Matthew. Now, as we look at the first chapter of Matthew, probably as you celebrate Christmas, you never thought about these, unless you're a part of a tradition that has a liturgy that reads all of the parts of the New Testament, I doubt if you've ever heard anybody at Christmas time read this long list of the genealogy of Jesus. But actually, the genealogy is saying something very important. What is it saying, aside from giving the list of all these famous people that are a part of Jesus' genealogy? And aside from, as Matthew, of course, is saying that he is comes descendant from Abraham, and Luke tries to say, yes, not only that, but he is descendant from God himself, because Luke traces the genealogy not back to Matthew, but back to the story of Adam. But in the account in Matthew, there is one very remarkable event, and that is we have five women in the genealogy. Now, I'm sure you know that the Middle Eastern world is basically a world in which genealogies are in the hands of men, and the genealogies that are recorded are always so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so, or so-and-so was the son of so-and-so was the son of so-and-so, and you have a long list of men. For example, in the 50th chapter of Ben Sirach, otherwise known as Ecclesiastic, Ecclesiasticus, one of the books that for part of the church, it's in the Apocrypha, not printed in the Bible, and for a part of the church, it's called Deuterocanonical, important to read, but not quite of the same value as other parts of the book. In that, there is a chapter called Let Us All Now Praise Famous Men. And of course, they're all men. So, in a list of men, what are we doing with this group of five women? Well, first of all, let's look at these five women and see who they are. The first one is Tamar. 
Now, Tamar is a Jewish, Jewish lady. She's a Jewess. And she was married to a man in the Old Testament, and her husband died. Now, according to the ancient customs, customs of, the, of the Hebrew people at that time, if your husband died and there was another brother, the family was responsible to allow the girl to be married to that other brother, and the children that would be raised would then inherit the property of the first brother. The first brother would, as it were, have children to carry on his name, even though he had died and even though he didn't have any. So Tamar's husband dies. There is a younger brother who's not old enough to get married. The family promises to her when he's old enough, you can have him as your husband and you will not live a life as a widow. You're still of marriageable age and so we will fulfill this pledge to you. And then the younger brother becomes old enough to be married. They don't have any wedding. And there she goes month after month, year after year, still as a widow. She gets upset. So she does a very unusual thing. She sits out beside the road dressed like a prostitute, knowing that the father-in-law is going to wander by. He does. He decides to sleep with her, and she sleeps with him but has her face covered. So afterwards, uh, he says, well, what payment do you want? And she says, well, you've got a good-looking walking stick. I think I'll, like, I'd like to have that. Fine. So he surrenders the rock walking stick. A bit later on, it's known in the community that she's pregnant. So the father-in-law gets out in a huff. This daughter-in-law, what's going on? I never imagined anything like this. And then she says, now, um, the man who got me pregnant is the owner of this stick. He looks at it to its, his horror. He finds it's his stick. And he does say, she is more righteous than I am. She has insisted on her rights, even though she got them in a very peculiar way. Now, we might call this woman um, a bit of a hussy, kind of brazen. She is a woman who says, I have rights. And in the ancient Middle East, she didn't have very many ways to get those rights. But she's got the... Uh, huh, the drive, the determination, the ability to make a decision on her own, that she gets her rights even though she does it in this very peculiar, immoral fashion. She's in the list. Okay, the second lady in the list is Rahab. Now, Rahab is listed, plain and simple, as Rahab the harlot. Who is she? She is a citizen of the city of Jericho at the time of the conquest. Here come the children of Israel, and they send a couple of spies, she has already figured out that this new people that are coming in off the desert who have discovered that there is one God who is the creator of all things, she's figured out that one God is the God and that the gods that her people worship are false. She has the courage to take these two spies that come into the city of Jericho to sort of search out how strong the city is. She hides them, saves their lives, lets them down over the wall because she's living in the wall, and they escape. And they tell her, look, when we, con when we conquer the city, you hang a special thread, a special rope out your window, and your family will be saved. So she is not a Jewess. She's a Gentile woman. She has led a bad life in the past, but she discovers remarkably the fact that there is one God who has created all things and that this one God is known to the Hebrew people coming in off the desert, and she makes this incredible decision of faith against her own community, against their gods, and against their leaders. She is a Gentile who comes to faith, a Gentile from a very, very a bad, immoral background. Okay, the third lady is Ruth. Ruth is a Moabite. A family from Bethlehem goes over to the Moabite countryside, and the two boys marry Moabite girls. The two boys die. And one of the sisters-in-law says, forget it, I'm going to stay. And the other sister-in-law, Ruth, says, I'm going to go with you, my mother-in-law, Naomi, and your God will be my God, and your people will be my people. She is a Gentile woman. She is a saint from the beginning of the story until the end. She follows Naomi back. And because of the saintliness of her character and her loyalty to her mother-in-law, her willingness to live in a strange land, 
because she is loyal to her good friend, her mother-in-law, even though she had no prospect of anyone else marrying her because Naomi says, look, I don't have anybody back home that could marry you. But sure enough, she is married to Boaz and the story is a great story. What do we have? We have a Gentile woman who from the beginning to the end is a saint and she too makes a great decision in order to be a follower of the one true God. The fourth woman in the story is Bathsheba. Now, Matthew doesn't like her. Why? Well, she won't, he won't mention her name. He just says in the text, uh, Dame David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. He'll mention Uriah, the Hittite, up in, from what is now Turkey. But he doesn't want to mention Bathsheba's name. Now, why? Well, I'm not sure, but I think he doesn't like her. Now, why might he not like her? You see, in the Middle East, people are very, very modest. And if you remember this particular story, Bathsheba decides to take a bath in the backyard. Now, I don't know if you've known anybody who takes a bath in the backyard or not. I really very much doubt if you do. A self-respecting woman isn't going to do this. And in the Middle East, your backyard has a high wall around it, but the powerful people in town have second and third floors. Why? No one is going to look down on their backyard, or in this case, their roof, but they have the privilege of looking down on other people's backyards. So this lady decides, why don't I just take a bath in the backyard, and there's only one house around here that's powerful enough to big build a second or a third floor and can see over the walls around my yard and look into the backyard, and this is the king next door. Why should I stick it out with this dumb, dumb Hittite who's just a common soldier in the army, and I could make it into the big time across the wall. All I got to do is just, you know, wait till I'm fairly confident the king is taking his daily stroll out on the roof, and I think I can catch his eye, and maybe something will develop. Well, sure enough, it does. David decides that she's a nice-looking woman. He invites her across the wall, and then he gets her pregnant, and then he sends her husband off to get killed, and then he incorporates her into his group of wives. So, hmm... A woman, yes. Jewish woman, yes. But uh, the tradition really doesn't like her, doesn't even want to mention her unclean name, but she's in the list. And then finally, the fifth woman is Ruth, is Mary, the simple peasant girl. She is saint from beginning to end. She is willing to take on the costly discipleship of being the mother of Jesus, even though she knows it's a miracle of God, but everybody else in town thinks she is just a simple, immoral woman and should be killed. And when the message comes to her from the angel and the angel says, what do you think about this? She says quietly, let it be to me according to your word. She quietly and humbly takes on a discipleship which she knows will bring to her shame in the eyes of the community and may be the cause of her death by stoning. Okay, five women. What kind of women are they? We've got Jews and Gentiles, and amongst the Gentiles there are saints and sinners, and amongst the Jews there are saints and sinners, and thereby we've got some kind of an idea as to the kind of people that this Messiah has come to save. He has come to save equally men and women because you can find the same kind of very uneven list amongst the men, and he has come to save the women. What kind? The Jews and the Gentiles, the saints and the sinners. It is rather comprehensive. And so from the very beginning, we get the glimpse of the fact that a new age has dawned, even in the list of these remarkable names of men and women. Men and women together are going to share in the new kingdom which Jesus comes to inaugurate, and we have marvelous hints of these things from this list of names. But then the second thing that really sort of stands out and jars me as I read the story of the birth of Jesus is in Matthew chapter 1 again in verse 18. And here we have the very well-known words as follows. Now the birth of Jesus took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, 
Before they came together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit, and her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Now, what does a just man mean? Please notice that when we say somebody is just, we usually mean that person is fair. What does that mean? Well, that means that whatever the rules are, he or she applies those rules equally. The father is just with the kids, and that means that whatever rules he makes for the kids are equally applied. The headmaster is just with the students in the school because whatever regulations are, the headmaster, the principal of the school, doesn't have any favorites, and the principal applies the rules equally in a fair fashion for everybody. But did you notice? The text says, because Joseph is a just man, he decides to put Mary away quietly. Now, the law of Moses had something to say about this. It said any woman who breaks the sexual code is to be stoned to death along with the person who has been his or her partner in the breaking of the sexual code. So because Joseph is a just man, he decides to break the law of Moses, not just any law, the law of Moses. Now, mind you, we're getting a new definition of justice. Justice now is not the man who applies the law. The just man is the man who breaks the law. There's a famous philosopher from Denmark who wrote in the 19th century, and his name is Soren Kierkegaard, and one of his many famous books is called Fear and Trembling. And he says, we keep think that, thinking that God is here, and then between us and the God, we the believers, is the law. God gives us the law, and then we obey it. But he says, no. The believer stands, and this is his language, in an ultimate relationship, absolute relationship to the absolute. That we don't stand with the law between us and God, but we stand naked before God. His primary illustration is Abraham, who goes up the mountain to kill his son. And any law says you should not kill your son. And what's he doing going up the mountain to kill his son? His obedience requires of him to do something that even the law says should not be done. And so says Paul, we should fill out our salvation with fear and trembling. And as Kierkegaard then takes that as his title for the book, Fear and Trembling. His secondary Kierkegaard's second illustration of this is the story of Joseph. Now, where does this come from? Where do we get this incredibly dangerous, risky, puzzling, amazing, revolutionary definition of the nature of justice? The person who says, I've got a requirement before God which says that even the law of Moses has to be quietly put aside. Well, this definition is already there in the Old Testament because we have this definition in the book of Isaiah. In the 42nd chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah dreams about a suffering servant, a special figure that is somehow on his way that is going to bring about tremendous things. He's going to redeem the people from the evil within which they live, and that special servant of God is going to be a suffering servant. There are a series of special psalms or songs that are sung about this servant, and the one that's well known is Isaiah 53, but there are some others, and one of them is in Isaiah 52. And it begins and it talks about, Behold my servant in whom I delight, my soul, my chosen one in whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. And that's the word that is taken up by the heavenly voice when Jesus is baptized. For the voice says, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. 
and that in, is actually the same word as we have translated here, the one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. And that's what happens to Jesus in his baptism. And then we're told he will bring forth justice to the goyim, says the Hebrew, to the nations. This is a unique figure. He is not just responsible for bringing justice to the people who are the children of Abraham, to the Jewish community, to the Hebrew community. No, this unique figure is going to do something more than that. He is going to bring justice to the nations. And then we find the phrase justice referred to again a little bit further on because it says that he is going to bring justice to the land. Sometimes this is translated till he established justice in the earth. But no, the word in Hebrew is ha'aretz, which really means the land. And whenever you get a prophet of Israel talking about the land, he's not talking about the earth. He's talking about the holy land, the promised land of God. And so what do we find out? This suffering servant is going to bring justice to the goyim, to the nations, that means everybody, and he is also going to bring justice to the land, and that means to the Jews. But in the middle, we get a definition in between these two, justice to the nations and justice to the land, we find the definition of justice. And what does it say? A bruised reed he will not break. A dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. These are parables. Quite often in the prophets and in the words of Jesus and in the apostles, they will put a climax in the middle around which they put a series of ideas. We can call them a series of language bookends, if you will, please. And so the series of language bookends in this text includes he will bring justice to the goyim, to all the peoples, and he will bring justice to the land, to the holy land, and a bruised reed he will not break, a dimly burning wick he will not quench, he will faithfully bring forth justice. So what is justice according to this text? An equal application of law? No way. Justice now means compassion, tenderness, concern for the weak, for the downtrodden, for the outcast, for those in need of help. And this is the definition of justice which we get for Joseph. He isn't observing the law of Moses when he does this. He is taking up the definition of justice, which Isaiah says is the definition of justice, which the suffering servant of God is going to bring and fulfill for the outcast, for the broken, for the needy, for those who are hurting, for those who need help, for those who are getting walked on. This person is going to bring that courage and encouragement and power and strength which they need. And that's what Joseph does for Mary. And so Joseph is a very remarkable guy. Okay, now there's another su surprising thing that happens here, and this is in verse 20 of Matthew chapter 1, in which we get a, a word that's translated, and I, I don't think it's translated right. That is, the translation we have in our text is perfectly legitimate in terms of the Greek language, but uh, we have to know that we have another option. There's another translation we can put into it. Because right after we're told that Joseph, because he is a just man, with this fantastic new definition of justice, decides to divorce her quietly, and then we're told, but as he considered this. Now, the word in the Greek text, and of course the Greek text is the original inspired text of God, from which all of our translations come, is the Greek word enthumeomai. And that Greek word has two meanings. Actually, its first meaning is he fumed. 
he got really upset. He started yelling and screaming and pounding on the table. He was so upset he could hardly talk. And the second meaning is he considered. Now, you see, our problem is we keep putting halos on these people. Fine. Okay, this is St. Joseph, a great, a great saint of, of, the, of the church, and we respect him as St. Joseph. But you see, whenever we get icons or pictures, there's always a nice halo around his head, and we're so concentrating on Mary and concentrating on Jesus that Joseph just kind of stands there, and he doesn't do much. But notice where this guy is. Somebody just came up to him and said, uh, Hey, Joseph, um, uh, I just noticed that your fiancé got pregnant too bad. Well, now, what is this poor fellow supposed to do when somebody tells him his fiancé got pregnant? Now, he's a human being. I mean, he's not going to sit there like some Greek philosopher and he's going to consider this thing. He's upset. I mean, you know, he can't sleep. He's, he, he's, really, he's really mad. God, how can you do this to me? I, I sensed it was your spirit guiding me to, to get engaged to this woman, and now this terrible thing has happened. And Well, my conscience says that justice from the prophets means I show compassion for her, but man, am I upset. And I think he is too. I think that's the way we should be translating it. But then that same word, by the way, also shows up in the book of Acts, in which Peter goes down to Joppa, and he's relaxing on the roof of the, sim of the tanner down in Joppa, and he gets a vision. And the vision is a great big sheet comes down out of heaven, and all the animals that uh, the Jews said were unclean, you're not supposed to eat from, and a voice says, take and eat. And uh, he's all upset by this. And then the, the thing, and he says, no, I can't do that because the food laws are very important to us as Jews, and I've always kept them very carefully. And then the vision comes again and finally again, and then the voice says, what I have declared clean, don't you call unclean. And then it says, and while he was considering this, a knock comes on the door from, from Gentiles who want Peter to come and talk to them. Now, I don't think he was considering it. It's the same verb, enthumeomai. I think he was really upset. I think he was crying out at God and saying, Look, God, why did you give us for this past thousand years all these laws about how we are supposed to keep the food laws? And some things are clean and some things are unclean, and we're supposed to leave out the unclean things and eat only the clean food, and now you've thrown out the whole thing. I think he's upset. I think Joseph is too. I think Joseph is a man of remarkable spiritual stature and that this stature is clear to us here and that the reason he's called St. Joseph is that the church saw in him the great qualities of this figure who had the boldness, the daring, the courage, the strength of character to stand up against his entire community and to take this woman as his wife and to continue his engagement with her, not to have her stoned to death by denouncing her before the elders because he had a vision of compassion as a form of justice to the outcasts and to the downtrodden and to those in need of a little help. And so when he goes off to Bethlehem, the men only have to record their presence in the courts in the Middle East. You take the papers for your woman, but your wife doesn't show up he takes Mary with him because he's not real sure what's going to happen to her if he walks out of the village and is gone and is not there to protect her. So we rightfully see him as a hero of the story without whom, had it not been for his courage and his understanding of the prophets and his willingness to break the law of Moses, fulfilling this great vision, there wouldn't have been any Christmas story. And so let us, as we reflect on the story of the birth of Jesus, try and see that story afresh through the eyes of not only Mary, the great saint, and not only our Savior who is born, but also the courage, the authenticity, the humanness, the courage of Joseph, one of the great heroes of the story. <laughs>